Psalm 70, and it says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Now, haste, that's really not a word that we use anymore. So I remember asking my mom, like, what's haste mean? Well, she said, well, you remember, this was earlier than the early 1980s when she was teaching me that word. And she says, well, what I remember is from a saying, it was kind of a joke or a saying, is when someone is sick, they might say, hasten, Jason, bring the basin. Have you heard that one? Maybe not. Hasten, Jason, bring the basin. Like, hurry up, Jason, I'm getting sick. Bring that basin. So hasten means to hurry up. And so if you look at this, we can see that our psalmist here, David, King David, is teaching us that we can say, we can pray to God, God, hurry up and help me. Hurry up, Lord, please. Help me, deliver me, and make it quick. The Psalm of David is almost, Psalm of Psalm 70, is almost identical to Psalm, another one he wrote, Psalm 40. Now, it could very well be that David wrote this shorter Psalm, Psalm 70, that we did today to be more of a general psalm for anybody who is going at any time up to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. You see, remember, David used this as, he wrote it as a a hymn for all people. They wrote it to sacrifice. They could sing it as they were going up to sacrifice at the tabernacle. Of course, this is the temple right now, but back in David's time, it would have still been the tabernacle and the tent more than the permanent structure. But if that's the case, if he wrote it for anybody going up to the tabernacle to worship, I think it's really interesting that he left in this section from the earlier psalm about his enemies. Let them be put to shame, these enemies, and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. So if he was writing this as a hymn, why did he talk about the enemies? Well, he wrote this hymn for all of God's people, which meant David saying, look, this hymn can be sung, the psalm can be sung for when he himself was talking about his enemies. This psalm could be used for all of God's people at David's time to sing about deliverance from their enemies, and he wrote it for us, that we can use this psalm too to talk about deliverance from our enemies. And what are our enemies? enemies? Well, we worship God who is our deliverer, So he delivered David from his enemies. He delivered God's people from their enemies and they worshiped him for it. And he delivers us from our enemies. And what are those enemies especially? Sin, the enemy of our sin in our lives, the enemy of the power of eternal death, hell, and the enemy of the devil himself. And we worship God because he's delivered us through Jesus from those enemies. Through Jesus' perfect life, Jesus delivered us from having to be perfect in order to earn our way to heaven. You see, God says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You gotta be perfect to go to heaven, but none of us can. Not since Adam and Eve took a bite of that fruit in the Garden of Eden, none of us are. So God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to be perfect in our place to obey all of the things of God's law to be righteous on our behalf. So trusting in Jesus' righteousness, that's given to us as a gift. So we have the righteousness of Jesus, so we are perfect in the eyes of God for eternal life. Also, Jesus, through his suffering and death, Jesus delivered us from eternal death and hell, because why? Jesus experienced hell on that cross of Calvary for us as our substitute in our place. And also, through his resurrection, Jesus conquered death. He conquered the devil. And even though that devil may oppress us, that devil cannot possess us. So you see, God is our deliverer. He's delivered us from these are spiritual enemies, and we worship him every day, gathered on Sundays, but every day we worship him for delivering us from these spiritual enemies. But what about our physical enemies? What about our earthly enemies. Does he deliver us from those two? Well, there was a missionary by the name of John Patton, and he was in the South Pacific. One night, hostile island natives had gathered around the mission station where just he and his wife were. Well, and these natives planned on burning down the place and killing both John Patton and his wife. So all night long, John Patton and his wife prayed that God would deliver them, and God did. They were surprised in the morning that when daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers, their would-be attackers, were leaving. 
A year later, the chief of the tribe was actually, praise God, was converted to Christ Jesus. Well, he and John became friends. And John asked them that night that you and the tribe who, that had come to, to get us and to burn all, down the mission state, station and to kill us, why didn't you attack us? Why didn't you go ahead and burn down the place and kill us? And the chief was, looked like he was surprised at the question. He said, well, because of all of those men who were with you, who were those men anyway, the chief asked. It's at this point that the hairs on the back of the neck of John Patton stood up straight. The chief went on to say, we were afraid to attack because we saw all of those men circling, making circles around the station. These big men, hundreds of them, and they had their swords drawn, and they were all wearing shiny white garments. I wonder if Patton and his wife had been praying Psalm 70 that night. Make haste, O God, to deliver us. And deliver them, God did, with angels to protect them. So you might be thinking, all right, make haste, O God, to deliver us. He delivered God's people many times. He delivered David from his enemies. He delivers us in many ways. So you might be asking today, why didn't God deliver our brothers and sisters in Sutherland Springs, Texas, last Sunday morning? Well, the disciples asked Jesus something very similar to him. Some people from up north in Galilee had come down to Jerusalem to worship, just to worship at the temple. They were sacrificing their lambs for the, the Passover when they became the sacrifice. They were just there to worship God, to offer the lambs they were going to eat and they have the Passover Seder when Pontius Pilate sacrificed the worshipers there in the temple. It was Galileans. He sent his Roman troops into the temple and sacrificed the worshipers who were there. What? It was a brutal massacre. So their blood, the blood of the Galileans, actually mingled with the blood of the lambs that they were sacrificing for the Passover. You know, it's interesting because Jesus did not answer in the way that I would have thought he would have, or you would have thought, or maybe even the disciples thought. Here's what Jesus said when they talked about the Galileans. He said, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. But I tell you, look at this. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here the disciples are talking about these Galileans who are just there minding their own business, coming to bring their lambs to worship Yahweh in the temple, and they get brutally massacred, and does Jesus offer words of sympathy or comfort? No. It's almost like he turns it around and says, hey guys, unless you live a life of repentance, you could perish the same way. What a way for Jesus to answer, right? Why God allowed that massacre of the Galileans that day, worshiping there in the temple, I don't know. We don't know. But Jesus took this opportunity to teach his disciples to live a whole life of, of repentance, to repent from their own self-reliance, their own sense of false sense of security, and to turn to the one true God, Yahweh, to rely on him, to cling to him for all things, including their physical safety. I don't know about you, but if, if I would have been one of Jesus' disciples that day, I, I would have had a hard time not asking him, Jesus, look, where was God in that massacre? Where was God in that tragedy? Why would God allow this to happen? Why didn't he deliver his people, Jesus? Well, Jesus knew that God was there in the temple that day in Jerusalem. He saw their blood shed that day. Likely it could have been even worse and likely God even refrained and restrained so that more evil wasn't done and that maybe it could have been even been worse with more worshipers dying that day. Brothers and sisters, we live in a fallen, sinful world. Every day somewhere there's a tragedy in this world. And why is that? Because tragedy is a result of sin and brokenness that started with Adam and Eve rebelling against God and it's passed down to each of us, our original sin. Evil will end one day, but it's not gonna end until the very last day when Jesus returns. On that day, all unrepentant evildoers will stand before the judge and they will get what's coming to them. There will be justice, and the Lord will take vengeance on those who killed his people. And that includes the shooter 
in Sutherland Springs, Texas last Sunday. Now we pray, we hope, we can't pray, but we hope that on the last moment he repented of his sin before he took his own life. It's highly doubtful, highly unlikely, and if he didn't, then he will face God's judgment. There will come a time when evil will end. But also I have to say that it could have been worse. It seems clear to me that God restrained him from further evil by sending that other guy outside the church to stop the shooter. God often works through people for his purposes. He often doesn't just send a lightning bolt down, but he works through other people to keep us safe and to do God's purposes here. And while it might not appear that way to us, God was there last Sunday at Sutherland Springs, Texas. Why he allowed it, we don't know. But we do know this. Through this event, God calls each of us to repentance, to repent from our self-reliance. Well, we've got this. I'm not saying that we don't use our brains, that we don't use our talents to do whatever we can to keep ourselves safe and to at least to reduce the risk of something happen like this here at peace. Of course, he gives us brains. He gives us talented people who know how to do this stuff, and we utilize that to the best of our abilities. But we never become so reliant on our own abilities that we forget God. That's when Jesus calls us to repentance from our self-reliance and to realize we completely rely 100% on our Lord God Almighty for all things, including our security and our safety. And he promises to work all things, even this tragedy, for the good. So this is our prayer. Make haste, O God, to deliver us. Let's pray. Lord, you are a great deliverer. You have delivered us from sin, from eternal death, and from the power of the devil. And we praise you for doing that through your son, Jesus Christ. Because we are your children and you are our father, we also pray that you would deliver us from all evil, from the evil one, from evil ones who want to do damage to your people. Again, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Texas. We ask you to comfort them, give them the peace that only you can give, the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we ask you to bless us as your children. Help us to do all things that we can in our abilities that you've given to us to love our neighbor, to defend our neighbor. This we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.